today I'm going to finish my series on worship. Uh, the atmosphere will not shift, but, but what I'm teaching will, will shift. Uh, the word, the word, and this is uh, part four of my God is worth my worship, and I'm going to give you the five benefits of your worship. Uh, the word worship comes from the old English word that means worth ship. It means to ascribe worth to something. We worship God because he is worthy. Our worship ascribes worth to him because of who he is and what he does. What you worship, you will sacrifice for and give to. What you worship, you will sacrifice for and give to. Married folks should be shouting right there. What you... (laughs) Amen, amen. Make sure God is first. All right. Have you worshipped God for what he's already done? Uh, God gave me a word for y'all, and and this is Luke 17. Y'all ready to read? We're going to read together, church. Say, say, say neighbor. We're going to read today. Okay. While Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance. And they raised their voices, called out, Jesus! Master, have mercy on us. So let's stop right there now. Why did they do this? Because see, in this season of time that uh, when a leper was in the area, he had to call out and let everyone know he was there. Because see, it, it was so bad that the leper had to know the direction of the wind. And he had to stay downwind from you because they thought the wind may be contagious. So imagine whatever issue you had, as soon as you got to closer people, you had to shout out your issue. Diabetes, diabetes, high blood pressure, high blood. Imagine whatever issue you had. You had to shout it so people could be a certain distance from you. Imagine the ridicule, the shame. And now you're in shouting distance of the miracle worker. How would you shout if you knew that if I could get too close to him, if he could just hear my voice, I might get my breakthrough. How would you praise if today was the day that you could get your breakthrough? You would find a way to get a praise. So the leper is sitting there saying, I think Jesus is coming by. Jesus, <laughs> son of David, have mercy. You will be quiet that day. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. When he saw them, verse 14, when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show the priests. And as they went, (laughs) they were miraculously healed and made clean. Here it is, verse 15. And one of them. How many, y'all? Now, how many did he heal? And one of them, when he saw (laughs) leprosy, a skin disease, when he looked down at his skin, something came over him. (laughs) When he looked down and said, wait a second, something has happened to me. (laughs) He said, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he he what? Turn back. My question is, have you ever turned back? I know you got your breakthrough. I know you got your job. I know you, but have you ever turned back and said, Jesus, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You know, because God has answered so many prayers. Have you all, have you ever turned back to say thank you? Look what he says. And when he saw Jesus, some of you had some doctor reports. And God changed that report. 
<laughs> some of y'all been diagnosed with some things and they gave you a report but when you came back and you saw the report has been changed <laughs> something on the inside of you starts to well up and say God you are good I worship you I magnify you you know what you do you say this my mama told me about you but I now I see you for myself I heard about you but I didn't know you would do it for me Jesus because sometimes you read the story but you didn't know you were going to become the story the Bible says we are living epistles. You are a miracle. Jesus. Okay. Okay. Here. The Bible says one of them, when he saw, he was healed. You know what the judge said about you. <laughs> you know what your superior said about you. <laughs> you know what the mortgage company said about you. <laughs> you know what they said about you, but yet and still, here you are. <laughs> he says, he turned back, glorifying and praising and honoring God with a quiet voice. What, 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 what? My Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord. <laughs> Woo! Look at this. And he laid face down at Jesus' feet. That sounds like worship. Look, he said, he laid down towards his feet, thanking him over and over again. How oh, thank you. And the Bible says he was a Samaritan, meaning. What you just received didn't even have your name on it. <laughs> what I just gave you was for the Israelites, but you were so hungry that you can't, see, you can force, man. The Bible says, if you draw nigh to him, he will draw. And one person says, I got to get close to Jesus. <laughs> He's a Samaritan. Jesus says, this should not even be you. The Israelites should have been coming back saying thank you. This is much like some believers when unbelievers praise better than you. Oh, you know how to praise when the football came come on. Oh, you know how to praise when your baby get good grades. <laughs> but where's your praise for the, for the person who gave you breath? The Bible says, let everything that have breath pray. So, so the prerequisite to praise is breath. So if I got breath in my body, I should have a praise. Because the Bible says, let everything that have breath. Okay. Now listen what Jesus said. This is not Jomo. Listen what Jesus said. I ain't even got the point one. Hallelujah. This is my intro. Was, let's read this together, church. Verse, verse 17. Then Jesus asked, were not 10 of you cleansed? Where? Some of y'all used to come to church. God give you a breakthrough, don't see you for six months. Where you at? But when you in trouble, <laughs> when you need something, he said, where are they? Where are they? Pastor that says COVID, but you at the mall, where are they? 
They say it's COVID, but you at work. Where are they? You everywhere else. Then Jesus, where? <laughs> so, see, we ain't streaming, so ain't nobody feelings getting hurt right now. <laughs> but I ain't scared. I might have said that yesterday. I don't remember. All right. Look what he says. Where are the other nine? Verse 18. Was there no one found to return and give thanks and praise God? Except, look what he says. Except this foreign. Jesus said to him, get up, go on your way. Yeah. Your faith, your personal trust in me, ah, your confidence yeah, in God's power. Yeah, come on, come on. There's somebody dealing with a health issue right now. There's somebody, I'm talking to you right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what the doctor said, but you are Jehovah. Rafa, you are my healer. I command every organ and every tissue of my body to line up to your word. Lord, you are a healer. Your word says you'll take sickness and disease away from me. I stand on your word. Make a testimony out of me, Lord. I believe your word. I trust your word, Father. All right. The five benefits of worship, number one. <laughs> oh, I got five points and boy, my time is flying. My worship, point number one, my worship will change my focus. Job is going through a tough season. In chapter one, the Bible speaks that the sons of God came together for a meeting and the devil came with them. Oh, I know you didn't like that part, but the devil's a son too. He a raggedy son, but he a son. And he says to them, he says, uh, God says, uh, where have you been, Satan? And Satan says, I've been going to and fro, seeing who I could devour. And God says to him, have you considered my servant Job? Oh, sometimes in life you think because you're going hell, you did something wrong. It may be God trying to shine a light on you. Have you considered my servant Job. There's none like him in all the earth. And then Satan says, though, the only reason he praises you is because you put a hedge around him. Uh, you've protected him. You've prospered him. He got his money right. His kids are right. You, you, you hooked him up. He, he should praise you. But uh, I believe if you, if you take all his stuff away, I believe he'll curse you. And God says, well, let's see but don't touch his body. You know, as I meditated on this word, I said, Lord, how come the wife could just sit there and talk crazy? <laughs> you said, don't touch his body. You didn't say nothing about the wife, but she, she's sitting there just talking crazy to the brother. I mean, all the kids got killed. She's sitting there just talking, curse God and die. Lord have Jesus, the encouragement she gave him. But, this is good for the Bible. The husband covers the wife and they are one. So if you touch the wife, you touch Job. I hope y'all get that. The, the devil could not touch her because she was a part of him. Boy, if y'all marriages can get together on that thing, you don't realize the power that you release when you understand that revelation. Okay, let's get into the word. The Bible says this, glory to God. This is Job chapter 1. One day, everyone say one day. When Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house. The, they all had houses. Mm -hmm. A messenger arrived at Job's home with the news. Your oxen were plying, plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. When the Sabians raided us, they stole all the animals and killed the farm hands. I am the only one to escape. While, verse 16, while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with news the fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all your shepherds. And I'm the only one to escape 
to tell you. Verse 17, while he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with the news. Three bands of, of Chaldeans raided, have stolen all your camels and killed all your servants. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. You know what this is? This is bankruptcy. This is foreclosure. This is repossession. Come on, come on. This is all hell coming at you. To God be the glory. That's why the Bible says the enemy comes in like a flood. So when the enemy attacks you, he attacks you on every side to overwhelm you. And that's why you have to understand how the attack comes so you don't get so discouraged in it because this is normal. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that this is common for man. And sometimes you think it's just you. No, this is what it is. The Bible says this, verse 18. While I was still speaking, another message arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters were feasting at the older brother's house. Verse 19, suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Huh. Listen to verse 20. Job stood up, tore his robe off in grief, shaved his head, and fell to the ground. And what? Did not complain. I'm going to offer the sacrifice of praise. Not because everything in my life is all right. I worship him because he's worthy. And sometimes your worship is predicated on how you feel. You better get out of your feelings and start worshiping God as if it's already done. My worship is a down payment on my breakthrough. This is how I war. I war in my worship. <laughs> The battle is not carnal, it's spiritual. I'm going to worship God anyhow. Woo! <laughs> I'm going to worship Him. I'm going to worship Him. I know what they said. I'm going to worship Him. I know they said, I'm going to worship Him. You better get an anyhow worship. I know what I've been through, but I'm going to worship. <laughs> worship is not based on what you're going through. Worship is based on who he is. Verse 20, look at y'all. <laughs> Woo! He said, <laughs> verse 21, I came in naked. See, 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 Job understood, ain't nothing belong to you. You came in naked, you leaving naked. I know the funeral man gonna put a suit on you, but you... Now, just for teaching purposes, God did not take it away from him. This is a scripture people use at funerals all the time, but that's bad teaching. God did not take it away, the devil did. Job is speaking out of his pain, but God did not take it away. God allowed it, but God didn't take it. So make sure you get the teaching right before you say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. No, God does. The Bible says in John 10, 10, I came to give you life and give you life more. Uh, get your teaching right. All right. The Lord had gave me and the Lord has taken away. Now, in his, in his space, that's true, but I want to make sure you have the right teaching. Okay. Now look what he says, y'all. Go back, go back. Oh, yeah, yeah, verse 21. Look at this, y'all. Ooh, ooh. Praise, look, he says, the, the Lord's taken away. Praise the name of the Lord. How do you respond when all hell come at you? Do you call your sister them, brother them? Ooh, 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 pity party. Ooh, 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 pity party. He, he has a financial devastation, Jesus. home devastation. All his work is gone. Everything is gone. And he got a praise. He's praising God. And you got two issues and you over here in a corner fetal position. 
Get yourself together. Job understood the quickest way through his season. Because the Bible says in Jude, God hates murmurers and complainers. He hates it. Why? Because God wrote the story. He already knew what you're about to go through. So God is saying, do you trust me with this situation that don't look good and don't feel good? Do you trust me? And the Bible says, and Job never put his mouth on God. Say, neighbor, check your mouth. Remember, the children of Israel, they had a 13-day journey, but they complained. And it went from 13 days to 40 years. I'm talking to you. Please hear me. All of us have some stuff we're going through. Please don't complain because complain delays your season. The best way to get out your season, glory! Worship! Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Look what he says. In all this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Take your mouth off God. Because you delay your own blessing. <sighs> Number two, Lord have mercy. My worship will release me. <sighs> Glory. Number one, Job refocused to worship and off his problem. Sometimes you focus on your problem versus focus on your worship. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Your worship will take your eyes off your problem. Amen. It will shift your mind. Okay, my worship will release me. This is Daniel chapter 3. This is the story of the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, he says, here it goes, they answered Nebuchadnezzar, you're threatened. What it was, Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to bow down and worship the golden uh, statue. And they said, we will not worship your God. Even if we die, we're not going to do this. He says, your threat means nothing to us. If you throw us in a fire, the God we serve can rescue us from the roaring furnace and anything else you cook up, O king. But even if he doesn't, oh, put some stank on it, even if he don't, come on. It wouldn't make a bit of difference, O king. We still wouldn't serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Nebuchadnezzar, in his fury, cut Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego off. He ordered the furnace to be turned up seven times hotter. He ordered strong men of the army to tie them up, hands and feet, and throw them in the furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bound hand and foot. Fully dressed, head to toe, glory to God. <laughs> we're pitching the fire. Because the king was such in a hurry and the flames were so hot. Look at what the Bible says. The furnace killed the men who carried them. Let me say something. Touch not. God's anointed. Do their prophet. No harm. Watch your mouth. Nobody's perfect, but you better keep your... And everybody that touched them, the Bible says, what you set up for others, you will fall in. <laughs> While the fire was raging around Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 24, suddenly the king, Nebuchadnezzar, jumped in alarm and said, didn't we throw three men in, bound hand and foot into the fire? That's right, O king, they said. But look. Ah, so when you're in the fire, you're not by yourself. God jumps in the fire with you. And the Bible says, and Nebuchadnezzar says, it looks like a fourth person and he looks like the son of God. Sometimes when you get in the fire, you're getting closer to God. <laughs> and what bound them? Loose them. Sometimes God puts you in some positions to get you loose. Look what it says, and I see four men walking around freely, completely unharmed, and the fourth man looks like the son of a god. Nebuchadnezzar went to the door of the roaring furnace and called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked out of the fire. All the important people, what? You know what that reminds me of? The Bible says he prepares a table in the presence 
of you. So they all can see this. All the important people, the government leaders and the king's counselors gathered around to examine them and discover the fire hadn't so much as touched the three men, nor singed their hair, not a scorch on their clothes, not even a smell. You don't look like what you've been through. Say, neighbor, if you only knew my story, you don't know the hell I've been through. But I got grace on my life. The Bible says, yea, though, I go through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear. Say, neighbor, you don't look like what you've been through. Come on. Nebuchadnezzar blessed. Look what he says. Nebuchadnezzar blessed the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Jomo. And he sent his ain't. You better speak that over your life. <laughs> he sent his angel and rescued his servants who trust him. They ignored the king's orders and laid their bodies on the line rather than serve and worship any god but their own. Therefore, I issue a decree. Anyone, anywhere, any race, any color, any creed who says anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Jomo will be ripped to pieces. Limb to limb, and their house is torn down. There has never been a God who could pull off a rescue like this. And here it is. After the fire, verse 30, look what it says. Then the king promoted them. Before your promotion, you got to go through the fire. So some of you right now are in the midst of a fire. Don't even realize God is setting you up for promotion. If you can just be still and know that if God be for you, who can be against you? Number three. Oh, my God. My worship releases my warriors. We got to get a war cry. Come on, man. Second Kings 3. Look at the read, y'all. But Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet of the Lord here from whom we may inquire the Lord? One of the servants of King Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here, who used to pour the water on the hands of Elijah. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king Edom went down to Elijah. Verse 13. Now Elijah said to the king, what? Oh, wait a second. I know I said we're reading today. <laughs> it's a good school. You're just not, you not going to get skipped along. Say, neighbor, neighbor. we're about to read verse 13. <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. Just got to make sure you're awake. To God be the glory. Just sitting here, just sucking all my juices. You're going to work with me, praise the Lord. <laughs> Verse 13, now, after now, Elisha said to the king of Israel, what business do you have with me? Go to the prophets of your wicked father, Ahab, and the prophets of your pagan mother, Jezebel. Stop. What he just did, he talked about his mama and his mom daddy. <laughs> you know you're both, and your raggedy mama and your buck tooth daddy. I mean, that's, 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 a, that's a bad boy, you know what I'm saying? You, talk, you ain't just talking about him, you talk about his mama. And his daddy. You know, that's, there's some fighting words right there. You know, you can talk about my daddy, but don't talk about my mama now. You know, if it, all right. But the king, let's read y'all. But the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to be handed over to Moab. Verse 14, Elijah says, As the Lord hosts armies lives before whom I stand, were it not for the regard I have for Jehoshaphat, King Judah, I would not even see you. I ain't got time for you. Verse 15. But now, bring me the musicians. <laughs> I'm getting my army ready. <laughs> Woo! And when they played, it came about that while the musicians played, that the hand and power of the Lord came on Elijah. And he says, Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Oh, this is a word for somebody. Before your breakthrough, God is going to give you a work, but with the work, he'll give you a word. And the challenge is sometimes you don't want to do the work because you don't hear the word. But what it is, you need water, but before you get the water, God will give you a word. And if you follow the word, word God will give you the water. God will always give you an action step before your manifestation. The challenge is the manifestation step don't make sense to us. So we disobey it. He says, dig ditches. No, we need water. He says, dig ditches. He says, we need water. He says, dig ditches. Why? Because see, you have to make room for God. Right now, in a field, right in front of the church, we making room for God. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know y'all understand what I'm doing, but see, what we're trying to do is we're trying to dig ditches. Because see, we're making room for the next generation. We're making room, and sometimes you don't understand, when God is asking you to do something, he will give you an action step. They need water, and he says, dig ditches. That don't make... Verse 17, for thus says the Lord, look, it says, you will not see wind or rain, and yet the valley will be filled with water. So you and your cattle and your other animals may drink. This is, this is but what? Say, neighbor, my God is a healer. This is but a... I know the number seems big, but to God, this is a... With man, it's impossible. But with God... The Bible says, speak to your mountain. Ezekiel, speak to these dry bones. This is a simple thing in the sight of the Lord. He also will handle the Moabites to you. You shall strike every fortified city and every choice principal city and cut down every good tree and stop up the source of water and ruin every good piece of the land with stones. Now listen to this, y'all. Listen when the breakthrough happened. In, it happened in the morning when they sacrifice. Wherever there's worship, there's sacrifice. And as soon as they offered, look at the Bible says, the sacrifice of that. You might be you might be the biggest thing stopping your breakthrough. And suddenly, water miraculously from Air Edom, and the country was filled with water, with no rain. <laughs> number four, number four. My worship provides access to godly resources. You know, the Bible says, the Lord's Prayer says, if you say the Lord's Prayer, he says, it's our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth earth as it is in heaven. So wait, he just says, I can have heaven. I mean, I wonder, do you really listen, listen to what you're saying? So he says, I can have heaven on So now Solomon's about to tap in. Say, neighbor, tap in. Second Chronicles chapter 1. Let's read, church. Solomon, son of David, took a firm grip on the reins of the kingdom. God was with him and gave him much help. Solomon addressed all Israel, the commanders, the captains, the judges, every leader, and all the heads of family. Then Solomon and the entire company went to the what? They went to what center? Okay. Gibeon, that's where the tent of the meeting of God was. And one of the Moses' servants of, of God had made will, in the wilderness. The chest of God, though, was in Jerusalem. David was brought, brought it up from Kerath, Jerem, prepared a special place for it, and pitched a tent there. But the bronze altar of, that Bezalel, son of Uri, and the son of Hur, had made was in Gibeon. Here it is, y'all, in this place before the temple of God that is where Solomon and the congregation gathered to pray. Solomon did what? At the bronze altar, in front of the meeting, he... Okay, now, now do you see the same thing again? Wherever there is worship, there's sacrifice. They go hand in hand. You, you can't worship and not sacrifice. And the Bible says, and he sacrificed a thousand whole burnt offerings. This gets mistaught because they say if you give a thousand dollars, God gonna answer you. That's not. That's not. That's that's not Bible. I know you watch TV preachers and they say if you send a thousand dollars, he gonna answer your prayer. That's not Bible. Now God is sovereign and God can do whatever He want whenever He want to. But a thousand dollars is not gonna be. Uh, you can't buy God. Let me say it that way. You can't buy God. Uh, a, a wise man taught. We actually know God told me this. When I, I gave a, a $25,000 seed when my mother was in the hospital and she was dying. 
And that's Lord, I said, Lord, I know I'm not trying to buy, but I'm just trying to get a breakthrough. Yeah. And it didn't work out. And I was very angry with God. If you've ever, you ever been angry with God, I was angry with God. Amen. And God told me this. And God told me this. He said, Jomo, you cannot buy a miracle, but you can trigger a harvest. Meaning, everything you sow will come back to you, but you don't tell me how it's going to come back. I'm God. <laughs> that was a painful lesson. I received, Lord. Look what happens. That night, what? Worship, sacrifice. That night, God appeared to Solomon and says, what do you want? Worship and sacrifice. Asked, and Solomon answered, you were extravagantly generous with David, my father, and now have made me the king of this place. Establish, God, the words you spoke to my father. You have given me a staggering task, ruling this marble people. Yes, give me wisdom and knowledge as I come and go among this people. For who of his own is capable of leading these your glorious people. Ooh, he laying it on thick, boy. He laying it on thick. Lord, I can't do this without you, Lord. These people are so great. <laughs> your people. God answered Solomon. This is what I'll come out. <clears throat> Look what he says. This is so good. God answered. Let's read the church. This is what has come out of your heart. Notice he spoke, but God said this came out of your heart. Why? The Bible says out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So God already knows your heart. So God didn't respond to his words. He responded to his heart. Jesus, boy. Boy. You didn't grasp for money or wealth or fame or the doom of your enemies. You didn't even ask for long life. You asked for wisdom and knowledge so you could govern over all the people who have made you king. Now, I, I don't know if y'all understand how much money Solomon had, but let, let, let's the Bible talk. It says this. He says, because of this, you get what you ask for, wisdom and knowledge, and I'm presenting you with a benefit package. Some of y'all got them jobs and them benefits. He says, as a bonus, I'm going to give you money, give you wealth, I'm going to give you fame beyond anything the kings before or after you had or will have. Jeff Bezos ain't got nothing on Solomon. Elon Musk put him up, ain't got nothing on Solomon. Jesus. So notice this. If you get wisdom and knowledge, you can retain money. That's why you see people who get money and can't keep it because they don't have wisdom and knowledge. He said, because if I give you the wisdom knowledge, money going to come to you. Amen. You're not going to make bad decisions. Because truth be told, enough money done been through your hands. Yeah. Truth be told, if we calculate how much money been through your hands, and if you would have saved 10% of what you made your whole life, everyone in here would probably be millionaires. Say, neighbor, I don't know who you're talking about, <laughs> but it feels pretty close to me right now. Verse, he says, verse 13, what happened? Then Solomon left the worship center of the tent of meeting in one Jerusalem, and he set out to the work. Okay, lastly, number five, number five. My worship changes those around me. This is Acts 16. If you don't know the story, uh, Paul and Silas are doing what they do, and there was a young girl who was following him. She was basically a prophet, but a prophet, uh, like, like Miss Cleo used to be on TV. And so they got frustrated with her telling her stuff, and, and she was making good money for her owners. So then she followed them, and she said to them, these are men of God, and they, got, they just got tired of her. So Paul looked at her and said, man, get out, devil. And the devil flew, left her. But the problem was uh, she was a, she was a moneymaker for the owners. So the owners were very frustrated about this because they lost their moneymaker. So they called the magistrates and they got Paul and Silas together and they stripped them and they beat them and they put them in shackles. And then the, 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 uh, the jailer was told, put them in the inner prison. If, they, if somehow they are released, it's your life. 
So imagine Paul and Silas have been beaten, and now they're shackled, and, and, and they're, they're going in there. And of course, you know, they didn't have a lot of walls back then, so you know, uh, you know everybody saw them. In Acts 16, 25, it says this, but at midnight, <laughs> Paul and Silas were singing and praising, and the prisoners were listening. See, sometimes you don't know who's listening. <laughs> and the Bible says, though they had been beaten, they still had a praise. Though they're in shackles, they still had a praise. And some of you don't have no shackles and got no praise. And Paul says this, it's much like he said in Acts 26 and 2, when, he's a, when he was before King Agrippa, he says, I think myself happy. Paul had a praise in spite of what he'd been through. The Bible says this, y'all. And the prisoners were listening, and suddenly, <laughs> oh, and suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so powerful the very foundations of prisons were shaken, and at once all the doors were opened, and every, now, now, what are you saying, Pastor? Your brother's breakthrough might be tied to your praise. Your sister's breakthrough might be tied to your praise. Your road's breakthrough might be tied to your praise. We got to do a road check. Say, neighbor, is there anybody on my road that can praise for the whole road? Because see, you don't know how close you are to your breakthrough. And sometimes you might be the catalyst. The Bible says Paul and Silas didn't know everybody else in the prison. But every prisoner benefited from their worship. And there's people who are tied to you right now who don't even realize that their life is predicated on your worship. Now look what happened, y'all. They were released. Paul told the jailer, don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself. Because see, he heard what the, <laughs> the magistrate said, said, you're going to die. And the jailer took Paul and Silas home, cleaned them up, fed them. And after he fed them, he said this, what must I do? What must I do to be saved? Because see, when God shows up, what, I've never seen this before, what must I do to be saved? There's lies attached to your worship. You may not recognize people are watching you on your job. Your family is watching you. People are attached to your worship. And when you can worship in spite of, when they know the hell you're going through and yet you got to praise, that makes them questions like, now how do you praise when I know what just happened to you? How do you worship when I know just what happened to you? Well, see, I got a praise on the inside. <laughs> I cannot keep to myself. The Bible says, out of their belly shall flow rivers of living water. There's a spirit on the inside of me. And when I start praising, stuff start changing. <laughs> Woo! I close. Let me land the plane. Lord have mercy. I, I, was, finish, I was finishing my... Yesterday was long. Yesterday was long. I was in the studio in the morning time. I was finishing my, uh, my, one of my audio books. And then I had an interview on a radio show at 12. And then we came back here at 3 and I recorded the service, pre-recorded it. And then whew, I said, Lord, this is a lot. But I did, as I was closing my story yesterday, I didn't have a closing story, but God brought it to me. In my audio book, I read a story. And it's like this. A group of frogs were hopping through the wilderness. And two of the frogs fell into a pit. The other frogs looked in the pit. And he said, y'all, I think this pit is too deep for y'all to jump out of. I think y'all might just need to go ahead and lay down and die. But they kept jumping. I'm at least going to try. But one of them got discouraged. And he laid down. And he died. The other ones kept jumping. His brother came back and said, man, I don't know how you're holding on. He said, well, you know, some flies coming here and I licked the fly. Mm -hmm. Water, rain. 
but I'm just going to keep jumping. <laughs> One day they come back. The frog gun jumped out. They said, man, we don't know how you made it. We were yelling at you and telling you you're not going to make it. He said, well, I have bad hearing, and I couldn't hear you. I thought you were telling me to keep on going. And sometimes in your faith walk, there might be some people who tell you can't go in. You're going to have to keep on jumping, brother. I said, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to keep on jumping. I'm going to keep on believing. Sometimes in your life, people may not see why you jump, but see, I understand that I'm getting closer to my breakthrough. Say, neighbor, you're not going to steal my praise. Bow your hands, close your eyes. Father God, I thank you for your word. I pray your word hit his mark, Lord. I pray for souls, if there's anyone here today who does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that today is a day. There are some here today, Father God, who are discouraged, who are weary, who are tired, who are frustrated. Lord, I want to encourage them to keep jumping. They dance like David dance. Keep trusting God. What you're going through is but a momentary light affliction. Keep trusting God. Keep your worship. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and all have fallen short of glory. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. We're all under construction. Lord, help us. John 14.6 says, For I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through the Son. Romans 10.9 says, If you believe in your heart and confess your mouth, you shall be saved. I don't know where you are in your faith walk today, but I know Jesus died for you that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Let today be the day you make a change. If you want something different, you gotta do something different. Change begins with you. For he is the way maker. Some of you know God, but you've not been walking with God. Rededicate your life today. Some of you are looking for home church. I'm not a perfect man, I'm not a perfect pastor, and this is not perfect, nothing around here is perfect. We're under construction. But if you feel like God is speaking to you, I want today be the day that you make love first your home. Church, repeat after me. Father God, I thank you for your son Jesus who died for me and rose for me that I may have life and have it more abundantly. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Guide me. Lead me. Fill me. Jesus, I make you my Lord and my Savior. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Give, shot, give God a shout of praise. Amen. Amen.